Good morning, ladies. Thank you for joining me today and anyone else that might be watching. I hope you're having a beautiful day. Uh, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood here today, but when you get to hear it, uh, the weather may have changed. But let's begin with a prayer, please. Father God, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for this time that we have to come to you and study more about your word. Help us to be able to have open hearts and minds to receive whatever message you have for each one of us. Thank you for this day, in Christ's name, amen. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That's a quote from Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, and I think it's very representative of what's going on in this part of uh, the story of Joseph. Uh, we know that uh, we met Joseph the last time that we talked. Uh, we are in Genesis, the 37th chapter. If you'll get your book out, we're going to read some verses in a minute. Um, quite an adventure that, jo that Joseph is getting ready to go on, and one that uh, I don't think he was prepared for, and many times we go on adventures that we're not prepared for. So hopefully we can gain some information that will help us as well. So if you'll open your Bible to Genesis, the 37th chapter, verse 28. I'm going to read from the NIV. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for twenty shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph, Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether you think it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. <clears throat> Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Now, I would imagine that these brothers uh, felt pretty proud of themselves. They got rid of that nagging little brother that was always tattling on them. Um, and they didn't have to kill him. Reuben had talked them out of killing him. But when Re uh, they sold him to the uh, merchants, and then Reuben came back and found out what had happened. Uh, he was the oldest brother, so he was really responsible for all the brothers, including Joseph. So when he realizes what's happened, he tore his clothes in grief. That's what was the custom in those days that showed a sign of grief. But he did join his brothers in the lie that they told their father about what had happened. Um, Jacob, their father, grieved deeply for many days. He not only tore his clothes, uh, but he grieved deeply. He told his other children, do not comfort me, I will go to my grave grieving my son. I think that at the end of that verse that we just got through reading would have been an appropriate place for a but God comment, because we know God had a better plan, but God's plan is what Joseph is going to live under for these next, all the rest of his life, really. God's plan is what we live under as well. So maybe there's some things in here we can gain some advantages about. Remember when jo uh, a little bit where Joseph had come from. He really had a pretty good life according to what Scripture says, uh, even though there were a lot of struggles that they had in those days, like we have struggles. So it was the best of times in some ways for him. Uh, he was young. He was daddy's favorite son. He was protected somewhat because he didn't have to go out and herd the, the animals like their bro brothers did. In fact, he went out to tattle on his brothers, it seems like, in many cases. And Dad had had a special beautiful jacket made for him. But now that he's been sold, um, things are going to change. And so he is beginning a journey uh, that's going to be a, a rough journey for him. And we, the don't, Scripture doesn't tell us all the things that happened on that journey. But it was several hundred miles to his destination into Egypt. 
and he had to walk. There was no free rides or anything like that. He was going into a foreign land with strange customs, strange people, strange language. There was no dad to protect him, no brothers to talk to him. When the Midianites mer merchants got to Egypt, they sold him as a slave. Now it's the worst of times. He'd never been a slave before. He had been well taken care of. Maybe you have had times in your Egypt. Maybe you have traveled to a foreign land with strange people, strange customs, strange language. No slavery, but you felt out of place, confused, longing for home. Maybe you just moved to a different state and met strange people, strange customs, different exp expressions in the language. Maybe your experience in Egypt was when you started a new job. Strange people, strange customs, strange language. When our son sustained a bra major brain injury and was stable enough to be moved to a rehab, I encountered my Egypt. At the rehab, I had had to attend an ARD meeting. An ARD meeting is like admissions, review, dismissal for someone who needs some additional support in whatever area. Uh, this meeting was with all of his doctors, the therapist, and all the nurses, anybody that took care of Jeffrey, and me. I had attended many ARD meetings in my 30 years of teaching school. Uh, again, we would meet with a parent and come up with a plan to help their child get additional educational support. I understood what an ARD was all about. Uh, I, it, I spoke my language when I was in an ARD, and I worked with people that I was familiar with, so I knew what that was all about, but not in the case with Jeffrey's ARD. I was, first of all, very intimidated by all of the professional medical people who talked in terms I wasn't familiar with. Things like cerebral trauma, intracranial pressure, etc. I had no idea what all of that meant. The whole first meeting, I had no interaction with anyone in that room. They talked in terms I didn't understand. No one looked at me or asked if I had a comment or a concern, and I didn't know if I did or if I didn't. I left the meeting crying. I looked down the hall, and a friend from church who happened to work at the rehab was headed my way. He stopped me and asked what was wrong. I told him that I felt like I was invisible in the meeting. He took me back to his office. The first thing he told me was, they all work for you and Jeffrey. You must learn to speak their language so Jeffrey gets what he deserves. Then he handed me a brochure. He said, take this home and tonight you go through it and learn the terms. You don't have to understand them, but choose three or four that seem to be the more common terms and then when you go back to another ARD meeting, you use those words when it's appropriate. I did. What a difference. The doctors, the nurses, the therapists, all of them paid attention to me. They not only saw me, they listened to me, and they answered my questions. Yes, this is a totally different situation than what Joseph had to endure, but it illustrates how things in our own lives can affect us with confusion, fear, dread, as I'm sure Joseph's situation must have affected him. But God had a better plan for Joseph, and he has a better plan for you and me. We have to trust that. Part of God's plan was that Joseph would be bought by Potiphar, who was one of Pharaoh's officials. Potiphar was, according to scripture, the captain of the guard. In other words, he was over all the other guards. Now if you will open your Bible to Genesis the 39th chapter beginning in verse 1. We're going to read a few verses. Uh, this gets into the interesting part of this story. Uh, excitement begins to happen with jo Joseph. And as we read this, um, pay attention to God's intervention and the things that he does for Joseph in this situation. Beginning chapter 39 verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, he was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. Notice, God was with Joseph and Joseph prospered. And he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. He wasn't a slave like we think of a slave. He was a servant. 
When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes, in Potiphar's eyes, and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Potiphar had a great trust in Joseph because Joseph uh, was blessed by the Lord, and Joseph began to show how trustworthy he was. And so Potiphar said, you're over everything. I don't want to be bothered with any of it. All I want to know about is when it's time to eat. So now Joseph was a well-built and handsome man, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. So she was trying to seduce him, trying to get him to do what she wanted him to do. And he knew it was wrong. He wasn't going to go against the will of his uh, owner, Potiphar. And he certainly wasn't going to do what was wrong in the sight of God. That's, what, that's why God kept blessing Joseph, because Joseph was always in tune to what God wanted him to do. One day he went into the house to attend his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. So he immediately realized danger was here. So he grabbed the cloak. She grabbed it, and he left the cloak behind, and he left. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. She's got a tattle on him now. Look, she said to them, This Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak behind, beside me and ran out of the house. Okay, so now she's lying. She kept her, his cloak beside her until her master came home. Until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make, me sport, to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Well, naturally, he's going to believe his wife. And this story seemed very realistic to him. So he was very angry, not at his wife, but at supposedly Joseph, who had so-called committed what she said, which he had not. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Notice this. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. Okay, so we've gone from Potiphar's house where the Lord was with him and blessed him. He's now in prison where the Lord is still with him. So God still has a plan for Joseph, even though he's in prison. Uh, he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prisoner, prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison and he was made responsible for all that was done there. So now the prison warden has turned everything over to Joseph. He's going to be in charge of the activities that go on inside that prison. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Isn't that a wonderful statement? God gave Joseph blessings beyond blessings, and he was with him through every step that he took because he, well, he was in, in charge, as he is in charge in our lives, but he wanted to bless Joseph, and Joseph uh, certainly deserved it. What a story. Joseph was this handsome, well-built young man, and he appeared to be available to Mrs. Potiphar, so she struck like a coiled-up snake. Uh, 
She tried to seduce him, but Joseph was determined to keep his focus on God. He always wanted to do what was right in God's sight. You know, sin sometimes strikes us when we're in those low emotional times. Uh, we can be lonely, discouraged, frightened, in our own type of prison, so to speak, something that's holding us back and captured us. Uh, not that Joseph was experiencing that because he realized that, jo that God was there with him and, and right there to help him and bless him. Uh, but in our lives, sometimes we have struggles and uh, we get down low and we aren't really as aware of what's going on as we should be, maybe. And so we begin to let sin seep in. It might be something like uh, if you have an addiction to alcohol. Well, I could just take one more drink. I know I can control it. But then it leads to more drinks. Or maybe it's not a drink. Maybe it's a pill. Or maybe it's a flirtatious look, look you give your boss. Um, or some kind of a binge eating spell. You know, there are a lot of things we can be addicted to. But we need to be careful like Joseph was. We need to be aware. We need to be careful. And we need to be in control. Plan ahead for occasions. Don't wait until the moment that we're in an occasion to figure out what I would do in that situation. Plan for, a, for it ahead of time. We need to be firm in our conviction to God as Joseph was firm. Ask God for strength to be strong enough to flee, flee when, just as Joseph did. We need to be in control of our emotions and not the other way around. Joseph's concern was not for lust of the forbidden. He was concerned for the loyalty to his master and especially to his focus on God. God was the most special thing for, to Joseph, but he also wanted to be fair to his uh, master. We can choose to be to please God rather than to give in to our fleshly desires because when we don't, we end up with some grave circumstances or consequences. Many times those consequences last for the rest of our lives. Even though Joseph had done right in the eyes of God, Potiphar still put him in prison. Look at uh, Genesis 40 verse 15. Joseph speaking, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put into in the dungeon. Joseph wasn't blaming anybody. He didn't even mention Mrs. Potiphar's name. He just said, I'm innocent. I have not done what I've been punished for. But he was in prison at any rate. Uh, Joseph took care of everything that was in the uh, prison, as I mentioned a while ago. And it gave the prison keeper, or the warden, an opportunity to observe what Joseph was like, what he was all about, and that was going to be helpful later. In God's economy, God turns evil, those things that are undesirable, into something that's more positive and more beneficial. And that's what he did with Joseph. The, the prison was undesirable. It was a horrible thing to have to be in that because it wasn't luxurious like we have some prisons today. It was a very dark, damp, uh, lonely place with very little light, but yet Joseph was in charge of everybody that was in there. And by allowing those positive things to come to light, then Joseph was better able to glorify God, like we are able to glorify God. That doesn't mean that there weren't challenges and uh, struggles and disappointments for Joseph. There still was those, but for the most part, uh, it was better than it could have been. Uh, always, as Joseph did, we need to remember God's sovereignty. Remember, he is in total control of the universe. It is always in place because God puts it in place. We need to remember that in our situations today, whether it's coronavirus or a uh, lost job or whatever it might be, God is still in control. His purpose will be done even the worst of times. When our son was murdered, our world came crashing down. How could this be? He had survived a traumatic brain injury and seven years of struggles and difficulties. Why this? Why now? How can we move forward? The very night of Jeffrey's death, Bill and I made a promise to each other and to God. First, we wanted to keep Jeffrey's name alive. Secondly, we wanted, and, and most importantly, we wanted to glorify God. How? We didn't know at that point. We really didn't even feel like doing it right then, but we did it. 
Gradually, God gave us the desire to reach out to other grieving parents and to grieving families in general. The evil that had been intended was beginning to be changed to something good that honored God, gave us a purpose, and allowed us to help others. Joseph had been taking care uh, of the cup bearer and the baker back at Potiphar's house. Uh, he was a servant and he took care of them as well. Well, they ended up in prison also. They had done something that Pharaoh didn't like. And so they both ended up in prison. Again, Joseph is taking care of them, even in prison. And so one day he noticed that they both looked kind of dejected and he asked what was going on. Both of the men had had dreams the night before, but they didn't understand what it meant. And so they came to Joseph and, and asked, and he said, well, God interprets your dreams, but I will explain their meanings. So the cupbearer says that his dream, he saw a vine with three branches. Uh, the branches budded, they blossomed, and they produced grapes. He had the cup of Pharaoh in his hand. He squeezed the grapes into the cup, and he put the cup back in Pharaoh's hand. So Joseph interprets that the three branches equal it three days. In three days, that cupbearer uh, would go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, Pharaoh would lift his head and restore the cupbearer to his original job, and everything would be okay. Joseph says to the cupbearer, when you get back and all this happens to you, please remember me and how I've treated you. I'm still in prison. I need some help. Then the baker's dream uh, was that on his head were three baskets filled with baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating all of the things out of the basket that was on his head. Joseph explained, explained that the three baskets also represent three days for him, but in three days, Pharaoh will cut off his head and impale him on a pole. Ouch! That didn't sound very promising, did it? It didn't turn out as well for him as it had the cupbearer. Then the birds will eat your flesh. The chief cupbearer that was mentioned earlier, however, did not remember Joseph when he was back. So often we get, dis we get uh, disappointed by families, don't we? Now let's look at Psalm 105, verse uh, 16 to 22. Psalm 105. get my pages turned here 105 verse 16 through 22 I'm reading this from the message then he called down a famine on the country he broke every last blade of wheat and he sent a man on ahead Joseph sold as a slave they put cruel chains in on his ankles an iron collar around his neck until God's word came to the Pharaoh and God confirmed his promise. God sent the king to release him. This is talking about Joseph. The Pharaoh set Joseph free. He appointed him master of his palace, put him in charge of all his business, to personally instruct his princes and train his advisors in wisdom. God definitely was with Joseph, wasn't he? He not only released him, but he put him in the favor of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh put him in charge of all of Egypt eventually we'll find out what a blessing God uses events people difficulties pain to test us and to purify us to refine us like silver the Hebrew verb for test means to look at closely or to choose James 1 verse 2 3 4 let's look at that real quickly James the first chapter verse 1 If I just tell you. Uh, first chapter 2 through 4. In this you will greatly rejoice. Oh, now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come to you, come so that your faith of greater wealth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So we're gonna have some difficulties. We're going to have some pain. We're gonna have some things that are not comfortable for us to deal with, but those are temporary. They're so 
minute compared to our, our faith developing and the home that we'll have in heaven one day. And so that's a great reminder that when we go through these struggles, when we find ourselves in our own prisons, whatever that might be, um, they're temporary. I do not believe that God causes hardships in our lives, but I do believe He allows them so that He can test our faith. One test strengthens us for the next test. With Joseph, God used Joseph's time in prison to test him. I'm going to get my pages turned here. And to strengthen him again for the next challenge, because there were going to be more challenges with Joseph, just like there's always more challenges with us. Praise God, our tests do not last forever. 1 Peter 1, verse 6 through 7, if you'll turn over there. Actually, I think that's what I just got through reading to you. I am so sorry. Uh, we'll forget about James for right now. Uh, we just read that, that our, our problems, our sorrows, our pain only lasts for a short time. Sorry, I got confused. The beauty of all of this is his will, uh, that he will use those trials, those testing times, to glorify himself, and they will strengthen and refine us. Uh, if you've experienced things like that, and I know most of us have, we go through one struggle and we realize how powerful God was in getting us through that struggle, then we're a little bit more prepared for the next struggle. When our son was injured with his brain injury, I'd never dealt with anything like that. I'd never even imagined that I would have to deal with anything like that. And yet God strengthened us every day, gave us blessings every day. And so we trusted that he was going to take care of us, and he did. And I think it prepared us uh, for the next se through the next seven years for the things that we would have to deal with when we lost Jeffrey, when he was murdered. Uh, didn't make it easier necessarily, but we knew God was there. And we knew that he was going to strengthen us. And whatever we had to deal with, he was going to get us through that situation. And uh, it did make it easier because we trusted in God. We were in his hands. If we don't use uh, what he has done for us in those situations, uh, and if we don't glorify him through that and tell how we got through it with his help, then we've wasted a beautiful opportunity. I don't know what jo go Joseph would have been like if he hadn't gone to prison, but I do know he was stronger and better because of his experience, because God purified him through every one of those experiences. Now let's turn back to James 1, verse 1 through 4, I believe it is. Actually, verse 2 through 4, or actually, just we'll just read verse, yeah, 2 through 4. James 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish us, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Those experiences, those trials, those struggles that we go through are not wasted. They are times of testing. They are times of purifying us, making us more of what we should be like with God, making us more able to handle the next uh, struggle, difficulty, and even if we don't have another difficulty or struggle, which I doubt, but we are better prepared to minister to other people. We're better to say, I, I understand my situation is different than yours, but I understand the struggle that you're going through. Trust me, God will help you get through it. And that is so true in so many things in our lives. We must trust that. We must practice that. It is easier to serve God in the good times than in the difficult. I think we would all agree with that. Uh, it's real easy to say, oh God, thank you for all the things I have, but when I don't have those things, do I still thank God for them? Or if I'm going through a struggle, do I thank God for that struggle? We should. Uh, we don't always do that, do we? <coughs> Kelly Mentor, who is doing an online Bible study right now uh, called uh, The Life of Joseph, and I'm doing that Bible study, makes this comment that I thought was really important and very pertinent to the things that I have dealt with. She says, We won't serve God more in the palace or in the good times 
than we are willing to serve him in the prison or the hard times or the times of testing. Just what I said, it's so much easier to praise God and thank him for the things that we have. But how often do we thank him when we don't have those things? When we are without whatever we think we have had to have. Like Joseph, some of our best ministry is in the midst of our suffering, our difficulties, or our crises. Remember, we have the beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus left for us. That Holy Spirit is living within us. He was sent to comfort us, guide us, teach us, and strengthen us. And so doing, then he helps us be able to strengthen and help comfort other people. Uh, 2 Corinthians first chapter, verse 3-4 through four, talks about that, that we uh, can comfort others because we have been comforted by God, and that's what it's all about. We need to learn from those experiences. Call on God, allow Him to use you, even in the depths of your suffering. It will be one of the most beautiful gifts that God can give you when you allow Him to work through you, even in your most dark, difficult days. There's always a lesson to be learned. There's always some way that we can glorify Him and that we can reach out to help other people. <clears throat> Denise Lipscomb sent me this, and I thought it was a very appropriate way to end our day. Only Jesus can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into a triumph, a victim into a victor. And that is so true. If we allow God, Jesus, to do that, we don't have to sit around and be glum about it. We don't have to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. <clears throat> we can sit around and be blessed immensely and have an opportunity to glorify God for the things that He has done in each of our lives. Thank you for listening today. For next week, if you will read chapter 41, which I asked you to read today, but we didn't get to it. Chapter 41 through chapter 40, uh, if we will go uh, a little further into uh, Joseph's journey, <clears throat> find out some of the things that he's struggling with, even in the best of times. And uh, if you will be prepared, then we will have that reading next week. I love you, ladies. I'll miss you. Uh, I know you get to see me, and I'm not. I'm sorry. Sometimes I look pretty haggard. I think, but I don't get to see you, and I miss that. I miss you. So take care. Be safe. And let's end with a prayer. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this study. Thank you for the time that you have blessed us with. Uh, like Joseph, we are so blessed to have you guiding our lives. Please continue to be with the Faust family and the Freck family, the Lloyds, so many others that have lost loved ones, those that are ill from whatever illnesses they may be or have um, going through treatments, whatever that might be. I understand that uh, our brother... Uh, um, here got a good report uh, praise God for that we thank him for bringing that uh, wonderful thing to happen we continue to pray for Leslie here and the baby that's due uh, in May be with all the new moms the dads be with all of us as we worship you and serve you father help it to be pleasing to you we ask that you be with those that are not able to uh, get out anywhere some of us can't get out as much as we'd like but some people are just in and can't get out at all Please be with them. Please comfort and strengthen them and help them to see the, uh, the glory that you have for each one of us. Again, thank you for this study. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Remember how much you're loved. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.